Hey everyone, I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. Delighted to be with all of you today to kick off a conversation series that we at DevX are hosting in partnership with the Hilton Foundation, in particular the Hilton Humanitarian Prize. I'm here with my colleague Amruta Vietnal. Welcome Amruta. Hi Raj, how are you doing? Doing great, doing great. Amruta is an Associate Editor at DevX based in India and has been doing a lot of coverage reporting on the issue that we're here to talk about today, which is decolonizing humanitarian aid. Maybe Amruta, you could say a word about why this issue and why now? As you rightly said, Raj, you know, we have been covering this a lot at DevEx and I feel like from the beginning of this year, um, things have sort of come together in that, you know, the coronavirus pandemic is raging on. And right at the beginning of that, I want to say around February, two French scientists said that, why don't we just test these vaccines um, on the African continent? And that gathered a lot of criticism. And the head of WHO himself said that this colonial mentality will not be tolerated. And given that this is sort of a more um, explicit way in which the colonial mentality did come to the fore, there have been conversations around this in the development and humanitarian sectors. And I feel like with the death of George Floyd in May, um, our entire sector has sort of almost re-examined its policies and re-examined the reality. And it has come to the conclusion that, yes, there is a race problem. Yes, there is a diversity problem. And uh, the way it affects the sector is both internally and externally. And that's why right now is sort of urgent. Um, and the moment is sort of right to talk about these things. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. These are issues that were certainly on our radar screen at DevEx before this year, and they were talked about to a degree, but the, the volume, the attention on this, on this theme has just grown dramatically, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to bring it today as part of the beginning of this conversation series. Of course, the Hilton Humanitarian Prize is normally given in person. It's, this is the 25th anniversary of this well-known prize. It's the largest humanitarian prize in the world. And very often the, the conversations that happen around that prize are on the on the big themes, the big issues of the day. And this is certainly this is certainly one of those. I think we've learned so much about the difference between you know racism and systemic racism with the with the protest movements happening in the United States and around the world. And I think similarly, you know, you hear people in our own sector say, well, how can you use this word decolonizing? I'm not, I don't have a colonial attitude. You know, we're here doing good things. But actually if you think about the systems and the structure of our sector and of the humanitarian sector, it is coming out of a colonial era. It's coming out of a colonial period, right? I mean, the, just the reality of which countries are rich and which are poor and why we're in a situation where we have international aid and donor agencies and where decisions get made and, and who the people are that make those decisions. Again, the, the, the intentions might be good at an individual level, but the systems and the structure we're living in really is colonial in many ways. And so I'm so glad you've been reporting on this at DevX and that you're going to lead us through a conversation on these issues today. Tell us who you're going to be speaking with, Amruta. First, I'm going to speak with Edgar Villanueva, who is the Senior Vice President of Programs and Advocacy at Short Foundation. He is a globally recognized author and an expert on philanthropy. He's written a book called Decolonizing Wealth, in which he talks about you know, how this mentality really affects philanthropy in the social finance sectors. And Edgar also works with Native American communities. So in the conversation with him, I really hope to dig into how his experience really speaks to the larger international development sector and what he has experienced and you know, what lessons he thinks uh, the experiences of people on the ground can bring to you know our boardrooms and uh, the decision makers. Yeah, and I think there's some tangible lessons that we can get listening to someone like Edgar, who literally wrote the book on this, as you say, and did it before this moment. He's been thinking about this a long time. And then after you have your conversation with him, you'll be speaking with two leaders in the humanitarian sector. Tell us more about who they are. Absolutely. So after him, I'm going to be speaking with Kennedy Orede, who is the founder and CEO of the Shining Hope for Communities organization. And he grew up in the slums of Kenya. And from there, he's emerged as this community organizer and a leader, as you rightly said. 
and you know he is sort of the right person to talk about this because he has lived it he has he's here to speak about it and as you will see uh, you know he is very passionate and with him i'm going to be speaking with Cheryl Dorsey who's the president of Echoing Green she's been a leader in the sector she's been around for a long time and i'm really excited to go into the conversation with them um, and really try to understand what their experiences have been, what the sort of varied perspectives they have seen in their work and how we can really adapt that into different regions and into different sectors um, and really sort of, you know, take that, take that forward into the work that we do. Right, these are both leaders you've, you've seen in DevX news coverage over the years. Kennedy is actually the recipient, his organization of the Hilton Humanitarian Prize uh, in the past. I visited him in Kibera, the, the, the slum area that he lives in, in Nairobi, that where he grew up in Nairobi, and seen the work of Shafko, uh, you know, firsthand, and also seen him, you know, around the world as he advocates for a different approach, a kind of a decolonized approach to the way we think about and do development work. And of course, Cheryl, she is the brain behind so many amazing social entrepreneurs and innovators around the world through Echoing Green. Um, so I'm eager to hear what, what both of them have to say about this. And then we're gonna be hearing at the end um, a message from a leader at the Hilton Foundation is going to talk a little bit about how this work on decolonization of humanitarian aid really relates to what the foundation is doing. Um, and then we'll wrap up and give you some sense of what to expect next as this conversation series continues. So with that, Amruta, I want to I want to listen to this great conversation that you and Edgar Villanueva will have. Um, can't, can't wait to hear more. Hi, Edgar, and welcome to the conversation. And thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. It's an honor to speak with you. I would like to jump right in, Edgar, and you know, uh, talk about how this idea of colonization and hence decolonizing aid and development um, have sort of resurfaced again right now. And right now it feels more urgent than um, it did perhaps a few months ago. So I just wanted to uh, bring that back to you and what your experience has been in this regard and how you think uh, colonization really manifests itself uh, in the philanthropic and the social finance sectors. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think we are in a moment of reckoning right now with the, um, the ongoing work of the Black Lives Matter movement, with the uh, exposure of inequalities at a heightened level because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think we're all grappling with issues of race and power in a way that is unprecedented, at least in, in my lifetime. And, you know, I, I think that the, the, the challenges and the questions that are coming up for all of us are uh, pushing us to think about the origin of these problems, right? So how did we get here? How did we end up in this mess? Um, and when you begin to explore that and you look at history, it starts there. Um, in my work in the US, um, you know, we have to point back to uh, four to 500 years ago with colonization and how um, this in, in the US context, how uh, the economy was established and founded and how colonization rippled across this country and the dynamics of that and what are the implications of that today. We know colonization globally, you see the, the same types of dynamics happening. And in our sector of philanthropy, of international aid, of charity, where we have really good intentions, we're not immune from those dynamics of colonization also impacting our work. And so when we think about issues of justice, of um, equity, racial uh, equality, uh, even you know, getting into other areas around around gender, we have to always go back to the root issue. And for for me, I'm very clear that that root is colonization. Right, that's really interesting. And uh, you know, you point out that right, there's also other inequalities, right? There's poverty, there's gender. Um, how do you think that you know people who are working in the sector today can grapple again, like try to understand? these issues and really sort of uh, look at colonization in a way that offers a lens to, you know, do better and uh, really include everyone and make sure that that colonial mindset doesn't uh, trickle down to the work on the ground. 
You know, I think of colonization as a virus, which is uh, how, how I talk about it in my work, which seems uh, really uh, interesting right now since we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, you know, colonization, often we think about it as this act that happened long ago, right? It, we read about it in the history books and the colonizers are um, folks that are lifted up as heroes in history. Um, but it's, it's actually understanding that colonization is a, a violent act. It is not something to romanticize. Um, it is about a, a global bleaching that is stripping away language and culture and destroying everything in its path that is that is not um, a part of the dominant culture. Um, it is an atrocity. It's not something to be celebrated. Colonizers are not folks that we should be building monuments um, and, and lifting up um, and, and celebrating in that way. And it's, it's understanding there is a history of that and how it's showing up present day, right? How is the colonizer virus showing up there's still very violent uh, colonization happening around the world, but in many cases, the virus is showing up in ways that are more subtle. It shows up in our policies. It shows up in our systems. It shows up in our, our mentality. And the way that looks like is, um, you know, the dynamics of this virus are about separation. It's about division. It's about perpetuating mindsets of scarcity. Um, it's about control and domination. When you look at even within the arena of international aid, right, where we have very good intentions around helping, right, we have to also understand that the virus is also very present in this sector. And that shows up around um, who actually gets to control and make decisions and uh, what does leadership look like of our, you know, in our organizations? How are we um, using power? Are we sharing power? Um, what, how are resources being deployed, right? Who gets resources? Who doesn't get resources? Who gets promotions and professional development and um, which staff are um, considered to be experts versus who isn't, right? And so these are the, the ways that are, I want to say subtle, but they're not so subtle when you think about it, um, ways that the colonial dy dynamics are showing up. It's in the who, it's in the what, um, and it absolutely is connected to power and money and who benefits and receives and makes decisions over those uh, over power and money and resources. Yeah, that's really interesting that you say that it's about uh, power because at the end of the day, it's also, you know, uh, about who is given that power and who gets to give that power in, yeah. in a lot of ways, um, right? And then in the international development sense, I guess we talk about the difference between international staff and local staff. So I'm also curious uh, how that, you know, uh, if you've had any experience of, you know, the diversion, or the, you know, the difference between these two in your work um, and how that gap can be bridged at all. Like, what do we need? Do we need more training? Do we just need uh, awareness? Do we need uh, to hire more diverse people? All of the above, what's sort of uh, top in your experience? Yeah, you know, we seem to have this like perpetual dynamic that shows up in international aid, but also domestically in the US, I see it um, operating. Um, I'm Native American indigenous uh, in the US and in Indian country where I do a lot of work uh, um, in, in the States. You see that same type of dynamic where you have national organizations that are uh, white led who want to help and want to um, you know, bring support and services to, to Indian country. And I think that, you know, of course, it's something there's obviously a need that we have in our communities. We um, absolutely need resources, money, we need help and support. But it's in the it's it's nuance in the way that we are um, delivering that support where we can be uh, guilty or perpetuating colonial dynamics or even ideas of, of white supremacy. Um, you know, there is a a direct correlation between who is actually deciding in the headquarters or whether that's internationally or in a national organization, who makes those decisions, who has the power, who's controlling resources. There's a direct correlation between uh, the who and then the how those resources are being deployed. Are we 
um, helping communities uh, in, in a way that is um, actually sharing power and, and, and building and respecting the self-determination of those communities to, to live and thrive in a way that makes sense for them. It's really hard when you're blinded by privilege and power sometimes to show up and be the best partner um, with communities, even in the, um, you know, the, in, our, in our intention to, to do well, we can cause harm. That's the message that I have for a lot of folks working in philanthropy, international aid, and in the social impact sector, is that even in our, our, our doing good, we could be doing harm if we're not clear, we're not holding up a mirror around how might I be perpetuating um, division, separation, colonial dynamics in my efforts. When you hold up that mirror, you should be asking yourself, you know, again, it's, it's about the who. Um, when we look at philanthropy in the sector that I work in the US, we know that 92% of foundations, um, CEOs are white. We know that 89% of board members are white, right? And again, there's a direct connection between who gets to decide about resources and where money goes. So we actually see an underinvestment in communities of color and in indigenous communities because um, we are not represented in those seats of power and those, this, those seats of decision making. We also see, I think, in the delivery of the service and, and all that we require, right, and, and the, um, the extraneous like reporting and evaluation and data collection, not saying that data isn't an important thing and it's a good thing, but it can also be weaponized to be create this barrier and burden on communities if we're not in relationship with those communities to actually understand their perspective around what they want and need. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. And, you know, the point that you bring up about really speaking with the communities and giving them the decision making power has something that has come up uh, over and over again. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, if there are any positive examples that you can share uh, or, you know, uh, models that exist that people can, um, you know, use and adapt in their own work that sort of shows that the work will get better. I mean, that's sort of the end point, right? Like uh, the impact will be better if you do involve people from the ground uh, and really just take their lived experiences into account while designing policies and implementing, uh, implementing them within these communities. Yeah, you know, I think that it's, um things are, are moving in a, in a more positive direction. I think our general awareness of how um, colonization, white supremacy, all of these dynamics are showing up in our work. That awareness is helping us to awaken, to understand how to do things better. Um, I think, you know, uh, what I'm seeing happen in the space that I work in philanthropy is more and more institutional foundations globally and nationally are, are beginning to understand, you know what, I will never be able to, to do the work in a way that it can be done and led locally, right? I can take you to an anti-racism training. I can um, meet with your board several times. We can do the workshops, but you will never understand my community like I understand my community. And so the path forward for me is, uh, is really thinking about how do we build the, um, the lo local infrastructure, local wealth, local power in a way for organizations to be able to actually be self-determined and doing that work themselves. So one example that I'll share is in my own work uh, within philanthropy, um, I've partnered with many, many foundations who are doing a better job of investing in indigenous communities. However, um, because indigenous people are not working in those organizations, they um, are biased. They um, they are you know often uh, subscribe to to myths about our community that we don't have the capacity that we are risky to invest in. We are building our own indigenous led philanthropic infrastructure to say you know what yes you should fund. Uh, Native American communities, but you should also just give us your money and let us do it. Like just hand over the capital. Um, we started uh, in our organization a fund called Liberated Capital that is a philanthropic vehicle to move and redistribute wealth to Black and Indigenous communities across the U.S. that is doing so in a way that is, you know, indigenizing the process 
um, that is really removing all of those barriers by, um, you know, that sometimes come about through partnerships with institutions that are white led. And so many of those found many foundations have come to us to invest and just give us the resources in a way that the capital is untethered, right? We don't have to um, jump through the hoops or just, you know, cre align with their theories of change and, and all of that. They are just giving us the capital and trusting us to invest in our community in a way that makes sense for us. And I think that's a small example within philanthropy of how the work can change and is changing. I think the same could happen in the international aid um, arena where we shift from that charity mindset that I must be here to save these poor black and brown indigenous people, right? Um, but it's we, we can shift to like, no, why don't I step out of the way? Why don't I actually um, move the power, move the resources to the ground and trust uh, local leadership to, to lead this? Um, I don't have to be um, driving this all the time. Um, those ideas of uh, white saviorism and the mythology that people on the ground don't have the capacity, um, or if I'm not driving this, things are going to go awry. Those are all assumptions that we must check um, as leaders in the sector. Right. And do you think COVID-19 uh, gives us the opportunity to really sort of you know, focus on local efforts more now that, you know, people are not being able to travel, a lot of the work on the ground uh, and business as usual is sort of closing down. Does that, is, does that offer us a window of opportunity to, again, like you said, trust local communities with the resources, trust local communities with decision making um, and really sort of, you know, give them the power? I do. I mean, you know, this pandemic has changed everything. <laughs> We're just in a moment of such opportunity for change right now that we we can't let this moment pass us by, right? Like we we all must do the work to um, to dig in and and examine ourselves and, and not be self righteous, but to hold up the mirror and 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 really do the work of. Um, understanding how to dismantle racism in our organizations and 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 in, even in our lives, right? So beyond beyond the work that we do nine to five, which what's a nine to five? Who does that anymore, right? We're all working all the time, it seems. But even in our families, right? This starts with us as human beings. Like, what are the conversations that you're having with your children about racism? What are the conversations that you're having in your faith community uh, with your relatives? We all need to be um, having these important conversations at this moment in our history as global citizens about dismantling white supremacy. What we're seeing happening around the world is that subscribing to this ideology, whether it is, um, you know, overtly or co covertly, um, is really destroying all of us. And so we've got to come together in this moment of reckoning um, to embrace ideas of collective healing. Um, and so I'm really um, excited about the, the truth that is being put out there now, the reconciliation opportunities and the healing because it's something that we all desperately need to move forward as a, you know, as, as, as people who can, who can thrive and we all want the same things for our communities. Kennedy and Cheryl, I'm so happy to be having this conversation with you today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'd really like to just get to the point here and, you know, talk about how the idea of decolonizing development has sort of been in the academic realms for so long and it's sort of resurfacing right now, given uh, the talk about racism and the lack of diversity, both in the US and in the international development communities. So uh, if I could go to you, Kennedy, first, uh, what do you think your experience has been of this colonial mentality, you know, impacting your work and the communities that you work with? And, you know, how do you think uh, you sort of carry this uh, experience with you? Thank you so much, Amruta, for, for this. Yes, it's been, uh, as somebody who grew up uh, in, uh, in, in, in the, from the South, as you know, it's been really challenging uh, at the same time. So as I believe, in, I believe in my community, I believe that we can bring change, but sometimes we get it hard. The way it's set up systematically, it's to, it was said to really discriminate. 
you know what I mean? Who sits on the board? That's a good thing. Let's start from there, you know, and where the money comes from. Mm. So you end up somebody from the South or Africa, whatever, or uh, somebody from the project, you know, in the US. So there is a system there. So you end up, you cannot really break that. So I've seen that a lot and they don't want to listen to you. Okay. Because it was set up to keep away the people of color without them thinking about it, you know? So, and uh, it's something that I've really faced a lot in my, in my life. Thank you for sharing that. Cheryl, would you like to um, answer that? You know, how do you think the colonial mentality has affected your work so far? And how does it sort of, you know, show up on a daily basis? Well, thank you, um, Ruta, for having me. And I'm so honored and privileged to be here with Kennedy Odede, such an extraordinary and visionary and transformational social change leader. Anytime I get to, to share a stage um, with this incredible young man, it makes my day, my week, my month. And you could ask for no better person than uh, Kennedy on this, who um, through his work as a community organizer, as a social entrepreneur, as a social movement leader, um, has lived experience around this topic. Um, you know, maybe I'll come at it from a slightly more academic angle. I think we're all sort of still in the throes of Isabel Wilkerson's brilliant um, attestation on this case, her new book. And I think she gets right to the heart of this, and Kennedy speaks to this as well, that you know colonialism underneath you know the mentality of colonialism is simply a system of control and it's just the the levers that are then built to demonstrate um and 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 wield control and power over the other um and i think it infiltrates and infects all systems including humanitarian aid including philanthropy and the work of so many social innovators like Kennedy and intermediaries like Echo and Green is both deconstructing and trying to imagine anew what work would look like when leaders and communities were unfettered by these sorts of strictures and able to sort of live and work into their own power and really determine um, you know, to sort of live their lives through a system of self-determination. And that's the work of the world at this moment, sort of deconstructing so many of these harmful systems that work for too few of us. Right, that's really interesting. Um, and both of you touched upon money. So I, I'd really like to explore that a little more. Uh, you know, in the world of philanthropy, how do you think uh, this sort of mentality has manifested itself? Do you think it sort of uh, shows up in the way that money is distributed or, uh, you know, how it's given to communities or not given to communities? Kennedy, uh, would, you re would you like to talk about what, it, what your experience yes. is? This? Thank you, Amrota. And as Cheryl have said, I talk about it. Think about this. I feel like this colonial mentality started a long time ago. You've seen the slavery. You've seen people coming to save the South. You know what I mean? And even now, things are changing. I remember that uh, for many, many years, you'll never believe that a young man from a slum in the middle of Nairobi will emerge you know I mean, to start their own movement for transformation. It has always been South from outside. We are coming to help. You see? And uh, it is, and of course, it makes sense. Where is the money coming from? And really make me so sad because you, I'm sorry to say this, uh, the people who helped me a lot is Sharon. I, I was like a green fellow from the year 2010. And really that's what gave me is what's called pitching. It's so sad that I know the solution in my community, but still, a could have to prepare me for this biased one. Like Kennedy, we are helping you in Shofko because out there is tough. So in some ways we have to behave like them. Can you believe I'm an African man going to America? I believe my movement, but I have to I have to behave as where the money comes from, which is controlled really by the white, to be told, you know. <laughs> and it was really it was really tough. So money is important, you said. So money, money for me is power. Hmm. And you have to ask yourself as a funder, are you there for control or for transformational change? And many of them, truth be told, many of these <laughs> funders, if I think about it, truth be told, I don't think they know what they are doing. That's why when you see statistics like 76% of black organizations really receive less and, and said funding. 
they are freaking out. They don't know that because it is a system. You mean? So I am so happy what is happening in the US. It is a time for us to look inside ourselves and to see where we have been behaving in a manner that is patriarchal. Right. Um, and the statistic you quoted, Kennedy, uh, rightly comes from uh, research by Ecoing Green and the Bridgespan Group. Shelly, could you talk yes. about that a little bit? Could you talk, could you talk about that a little bit? And uh, is that something that, you know, was shocking to you? Was that something that was apparent and was just uh, not out in the public domain? Or is that something that you've grappled with? Yes, so thank you for that question. And I appreciate, um, Kennedy, you referencing that statistic and the joint research project Echoing Green did with Bridgeband in your recent Guardian op-ed. Um, really appreciate that shout out. Um, so this was sort of a long-standing journey for Echoing Green and really predicated on the work that Echoing Green does. You know, we really have over the last 30 plus years become the world's leading angel investor in emerging social entrepreneurs. We have built a world-class, best-in-class fellowship for emerging leaders at the time, like Kennedy uh, and Jess, his um, partner. And so when Kennedy and Jess applied to us, you know, we get about 3,500 submissions every year from 160 plus countries around the world through an extraordinarily rigorous, if not downright Darwinian vetting process, we only select less than 1% of those who apply. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at the Kennedys of the world, the Jesses of the world, these are just best in class next generation leadership. And we were so good at it um, that we were astounded year after year as we would follow the progress of groups like Shopko and others, um, watching the amount of money that they weren't raising relative to their white counterparts. And yes. it was uh, ongoing, it was a longitudinal, entrenched and sclerotic problem that we um, just could not figure out how to crack the code on. So in some ways you go back to the old adage, you can't fix what you can't measure. And we thought by working in partnership with a, an important institution like Bridgeband to really raise up these um, inequities in funding that we were seeing across our fellowship portfolio, maybe we could help to spark a broader conversation about these disparities and then hopefully what would come of it. So again, Kennedy referenced, again, this astonishing statistic that when you look across our portfolio, and again, these are some of the best leaders in the world at the early stages of their social impact careers. And it is unconscionable that the revenues of black led organizations were 24% smaller than the revenues of their white counterparts in the three years following um, application um, application to Echoing Green. But when you actually got a layer underneath that and looked at the disparities in unrestricted net assets, the assets of black led organizations were 76% smaller than the um, unrestricted net assets of white led organizations. That disparity obviously much broader, but also more problematic and concerning because from our perspective, it was a proxy for a lack of trust for black leaders. Again, it goes back to what Kennedy was talking about, this notion around power, who has it, who doesn't, and what do these imbalances look like? And alongside these notions of power, we also looked at two other key drivers that we believe um, are propping up this inequitable funding system, namely bias and risk. So, mm -hmm. you know, by virtue of what you look like, where you come from, what your gender is, you are being excluded from these funding streams in a way that is inequitable um, without um, real care and thought around the relationship to impact. And then the notion of risk and how funders far too often weaponize the concept of risk to keep out leaders who look like me and Kennedy. So we thought it was really important to unearth and raise it up in hopes that we could generate a conversation that would lead to change. Right, that's really insightful. And thank you for that piece of research because then, you know, like you said, it sort of gives us something to show to the community and say, this is what the reality is. And um, this is why you don't see impact in the way that you want to see impact. But um, Amruta, it's really making me so, so sad, truth be told, that we have to wait for Echo Green and the Prince Farm to come with these statistics. It's not a rocket science, common sense. Look at your awards, look at people getting your funding. Can you just ask yourself why all of them are 
why only few people of color? Why? You know what I mean? And then it's all making me so sad is that we are trying to transform the lives of people of color. That's the truth. That's the, that the one who are really on the, on the bottom, you see? So then why don't you believe in their leaders? You as a founder, question for you. Why do you believe in their leaders? You still believe somebody else from somewhere else will come and save them? No way. So it just makes me so sad that Equity Green and Bits Farm has to come and be like, hey, everybody, look at these statistics. We are thinking, you know? And I'm really happy for what they did because I tell you, I'm not for, for free. Nobody could have listened to that research and data. But because enough is enough, and it's a moment for the colonization way of thinking that's happening in America, that's why they cannot listen. And I want to, I think, uh, Cheryl, I'm really watching for you. It's time that we keep on pushing because time is limited. I'm so scared that after election, everything is gone, life is normal. So we have to really keep pushing for this. Yeah, you're right in that, you know, uh, if something is so apparent for the people who are working, who want to work in this sector, why isn't it uh, apparent for the people who have the resources, right? Um, Kennedy, you also touched upon an interesting point about trust and uh, I'd like to dig into that a little more. How do you think the lack of trust from, from funders, from philanthropists, from the sector and the environment around you really affects uh, you know, social entrepreneurs and sort of community organizers like yourself in the work that you do and on a on a day to day basis. Yes, this is really it's really it's, I'm a little bit angry about it sometimes because it is not really factual. It is a misconception that they have in their head. You know, I remember as a man who loves history, Africa, Kenya cannot get independence. They are not prepared. You see, you know. Slaves could not be set free. No, 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 no. They are not prepared to be free. You got it? So it's, it's, it's a really colonial mentality. You know what I mean? That trust, oh, because he's a man of color, a woman of color, we don't trust. But they don't tell you that. It's the same way you see between the police and the men of color. Is that police doesn't trust them. Yeah. Why? It is in their head. So when you are, when you, when you are telling me that, uh, when you look at it like there's no trust, you ask yourself why? This colonization, and that's why we think you have to really speak this out. You cannot take what one person did of color to the entire population, no. If we take what is, has been happening with even white Americans, you know what I mean? We can talk, but we can't do that. We have to be factual, you know what I mean? So I think the trust is an excuse. They use that thing, trust, for example, in Africa, I would like to you. They are more like, oh, there's corruption. So mm. therefore, we, you know, and if you go, uh, if, if you go to a poor neighborhood in, 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 in America, they'll be like, they don't understand how the auditing works. We can't fund them. You know it? So I come back and say, what is your role then? You, are you looking for this called systematic change? Then how, what, that's why I believe in the green. So they're coming to you as Shofko, okay? We are preparing you with your systems so that you can grow. So why can those funders really invest also into the growth of these organizations that are led by people of color if they care about trust? <laughs> what do you think, anyway? <laughs> Yeah, no, again, I could not have said it any better than, than you, Kennedy. And, you know, again, um, I'm a, a generation and a half ahead of Kennedy, but, you know, he, he is an extraordinary um, social movement leader, community organizer, and his life's work and his example always takes me back to um, the amazing, amazing leaders of the civil rights movement here in the United States and sort of the work that they did. Um, but, you know, there was a, a very famous um, and terrible um, anti-civil rights police chief in Albany, Georgia, yeah. police mm -hmm. chief Pritchett, who said to um, a, a famous civil rights activist, he says, you know, I don't mind because you don't matter. Right. And it was it's in its purest form. It's the articulation of the value or lack of value placed on so many of us simply because of what we look like. Yes. And sort of once you get to the heart of it, it's so it's, it's explanatory. And in some ways it's liberating because you really understand where this comes from. But then the question becomes, how do you fight against this? And um, it, is, it is an all out multi pronged attack. But I think in this moment, and what we're hearing more calls for 
is one way to see power and thus generate more change is to start to shift, as Kennedy said, power is money, starting to get money into the hands of Black-led, Brown-led, people of color organizations is one of the most powerful shifts and leveraged plays we can all do if we're hoping to drive transformational social change. So in some ways, the old another old adage is, you don't have to know the answers, but you have to just get started and you have to make the road by walking. So simply by starting to move money, starting to invest resources in leaders like Kennedy, what a great way to start, a great way to learn, and a great way to understand how you can shift these power dynamics in real time. Yes. And then I'll add something else, Cheryl, that you said. Uh, shifting the power, I think that's also very important. <laughs> you know, how do you shift the power? But I also think, like, I think we also need the board members, trustees of these funding foundations, to, to start really asking themselves tough questions. You know I mean? And I think uh, the best thing to do is it's all about listening, listening to the voices out there. If you listen, you will end up making the right choices, you know? But what I've seen really scares me sometimes, Cheryl, I don't know if you say the same thing. People think because they have money, they know so much. No, you, you don't, we, first of all, we don't know how you got that money. We don't know the history. Anyway, there's a long history about how you got the, how that money is given back now, how you got that money. But you can have the resources. That's what I ask, which is called partnership. Somebody has lived the experience. They are bringing something else, you know? But some funders, they think because they have money, they know everything. You don't know everything. Start from there. And because you know everything, that's why you cannot, you cannot realize that in your list, those who are getting awards and, uh, and funding, le mostly less of them are people of color. Why? Because you're not listening. If you could listening, you could find this out without the research. Anyway, that's my point. That's a great point, Kennedy. And, and in listening to you speak, you know, I'm reminded, I mean, you're right, you, we, the society uh, ascribes worth and value to everything. Unfortunately, sort of the dominant paradigm and narrative is the conflation of worth with money. It's just, it's, it's how our society operates, especially in a market economy. I have been so pleased to watch, and this is why narrative change is so important, um, you know, a leader like Brian Stevenson, who is credited with sort of mainstreaming the term proximate leadership, right? Sort of that, that brilliant narrative um, lob that he threw into the public square of assigning worth and value to lived experience that really has entered public consciousness yes. in a very powerful way. What a great way to shift the frame. And I have to say, in all my years of watching this, this is one of the most powerful levers that he could have pulled to shift culture and thinking around where does value sit in society. Yes. So I think that's a great step forward. Mm. That's really and interesting. I, there. Um, and, you know, I just want to sort of understand to, you know, what are some ways that organizations who want to bring about change can do this, can sort of, you know, uh, take the lived experiences of people and sort of, uh, bring it back to their policy, bring it back to their implementation. And I suppose having a fellowship program like you do at Eco and Green is one of the ways to do it. But have you experienced any other ways, any other models that you think other organizations um, can look up to? Yes, Amruta. So I, yeah, that's a very good point. Because I feel like, of course, things are bad. I agree. But we're also making really great steps. And that's what I, I'm a man of hope. That's what gives me hope. You mean? So every day is getting better. So when I see someone like Cheryl sitting on the school board, I'm like, those kind of small things, you know? <laughs> and when Shofko Akibera Grass Organization received the Hilton Award, oh my God, who never knew that? That we can be part of the Hilton, like, you know? It's been known to give through the, anyway. So that for me is really progress, you know? And so, so I feel like uh, as now, and what's happening, well, let's, well, let's capture the history. We are living in the history moment. You know I mean? And I think with this moment, if the foundations, organization understand what is power first, yeah. who controls the power? Uh, and then start looking, start asking hard questions. You know I mean? For the past five years, let's do what is called revisiting. 
how, how, how we have been doing things. Because you might be doing it in a colonial style without knowing. Okay, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are really, res, you are discriminating, maybe without knowing, but still you are discriminating. I mean, so number one step is for them to look for people or to start to sit among themselves and reflect how they are doing their things. And then we also have to be careful how we are using the word scalability. I am a strong believer of scale. Okay? But don't use big words to put away some people who have lived the experience because they also know the change. Yes. Well, absolutely, Kennedy, couldn't agree more. And I would um, only add maybe from, uh, if there are funders uh, listening, sort of, you know, interrogating sort of the way you operate and, and what you do, um, sort of I've looked at some of the really interesting work that the Justice Funders Network uh, has done over the years. And they're now um, putting forward recommendations for the field, everything from you've got to you know, weaken top-down decision-making, right? So you can get away from rooftops and focus more on grassroots. You've got to expand the scope of grantee influence. So bringing leaders like Kennedy's voices to the table as you're thinking about deploying funds um, and making decisions, or like Kennedy said, um, someone like me who came out of Echoing Green, who's now part of this fellowship community joining a board like the Skoll Foundation. I think there's also good work being done by a group of funders sort of pushing forward this notion of trust-based philanthropy. And Kennedy's talked mm -hmm. about this. You have to build trust. Um, so if you're explicit about that and how do you build the muscles around that and how do you do it in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, um, it's so clear with so many of these behavioral changes that have to happen at a systems level. You know, Kennedy and I can talk until we're blue in the face, but until peers start to influence peers um, and they start to move together, it is hard to really make um, seismic changes. So any opportunity to bring groups together, like-minded folks together, so that they can walk in lockstep, I think is a really important way to move the needle on some of these issues. Here at DevEx, we've been reporting on the COVID-19 pandemic for the last eight, eight and a half months now. And uh, what we're really seeing is that this crisis is resurfacing some of the challenges, some of the gaps in power. Um, and it's really resurfacing some of this colonial mentality right from, you know, access to vaccines and who will get them, who will get to make those decisions. Um, so what I want to do right now is to really open up the question to both of you and try to understand if you think this moment calls for a new way of thinking about decolonizing development and aid and um, in a way that will really sort of take us into this next chapter because as we see it COVID-19 is affecting all of us it does not discriminate um, uh, but you know there are these structural challenges that still find uh, come in the way uh, so how do we sort of get through that? Yes I would say that the COVID-19 has been it's something terrible to happen but at the same time it's really opened people's eye you know what I mean and uh, I, I believe it's COVID-19 uh, is what really made the people to come up and say that enough is enough. And as we talk about now, they, they honestly, those who are going on the train, those who are bringing Amazon boxes, people of color, most of, most of them, you know what I mean? And they really, people felt really pushed on the wall and therefore they have to stand up, you know what I mean? And when they come with police brutality that they've been doing all the time, but people are like, enough is enough. On my work also in the community, for the first time, I felt the government really recognized my work, whereby they came to us asking us, how can we work together? Because right now they believe that community solutions are the only way. As we talk about trust, they were, nobody trusts the government. So you say that, wash your hands, social distancing, nobody was linked to that. So as Shofko, we went to the community and we saw some changes. Even the funders have seen, like, have seen the power of communities, investing in the communities, you know what I mean? So I'll say that we've got, we've got to be remembered that what COVID brought in is opening the eye of racial discrimination that has been existing for many, 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 many years. I mean, and COVID really comes in and now we can see the nakedness truth you know, of how life is. I mean, and that's why we are having these kind of conversations. And I believe that if we keep on this fire burning, we're gonna see a lot of things happening. Change is gonna happen, yes. Because people, I feel like people are ready to talk about this. Sometimes it's all about 
there is a moment when that moment hit no my friend you can't go back you have to move forward and we are living in that moment so we should not let we should not wait for long we should keep on pushing well, so beautifully said kennedy and i will say if we ever do this again i should speak before kennedy because you should never follow <laughs> kennedy on today we should just end this interview right now just so <laughs> brilliant and inspiring you're exactly exactly right kennedy and you know i was um i'm a frustrated historian and i studied his history uh in school and you know when you sort of look across the sweep of history um pandemics have always been with us um they as kennedy said always reveal the existing structural inequities right they're the x-ray machine mm. into our existing um yes. deficiency. <laughs> but they also offer a powerful moments of transformation and i was really um listening carefully as you said kennedy where you say this is a moment for potential collaboration and partnership i do think if if there's a transformational opportunity one of one of those moments could be around um smart cross-sectoral partnerships which is the very definition of social innovation right mm -hmm. so a government which may not have been moved in a way to reach out to an entity like shopco has in stark relief seeing that it cannot do it alone and has to rely on an effective partner like Shopko. And if that can be maintained and strengthened after we get through this, um, why not work with Shopko around yes. um, distribution capabilities around the vaccine? That's gonna have to happen across yes. all of the communities in which you work. I think there's a real moment to redefine what we mean by deep, true, and trust-based partnerships. So part of what comes next is not to revert to business as usual, right? So again, sort of channeling Dr. Ibram Kindi, the opposite of um, being a racist is not being a racist. You actually have to be actively anti-racist. And sort of the work moving forward mm. is recognizing the level of disadvantage that was all already fairly profound because of structural um you know structural racism and other forms of control um but you, you've got to do more than get back to the status quo because the status quo didn't work for enough people the question is how do we leapfrog beyond that in this moment um and the only way to do that i believe is investing in innovators like kennedy and so many others who have a trenchant analysis of key inequities in their communities and really innovative disruptive solutions that as kennedy say can also scale to meet the moment so i think you know we've got this opening to be innovative to not settle for incremental or routine progress but for dramatic process um, that leads to a better healthier and more sustainable world after we get past this moment Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you so much, Kennedy, for your time and your contribution today. I'm sure your perspective and your insight will continue to inform uh, our audience and we'll you know, keep coming back to you for your, for your contribution as well. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Amruta. That was a fantastic conversation. Uh, we are now going to hear from Shaheen Kasim Laka, who is the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Hilton Foundation, to hear a little bit more about what the foundation is doing on these issues. And uh, we really look forward to welcoming her to the discussion. Shaheen. Thank you, Raj, for the kind introduction. It's a distinct privilege for me to have this opportunity to reflect on the conversations we've just heard from key thought leaders in this space, each of whom I have the pleasure of knowing personally and respect deeply. The exchange we just heard is both timely and long overdue. And for those of us working in the social impact sector, development, humanitarian aid, and philanthropy, it's a call to action to do better. The good news is we can do better. We know how to do better. And most of us are willing to do better. The speakers called upon us to listen, to trust, and to follow the lead of those who are closest to the problem. In the spirit of true partnership, we must move to a place where voices from the community are not only valued appropriately, but are directing us towards solutions which will work best in their contexts. As we have seen through the work of Kennedy Odere and Shofko, a Hilton Humanitarian Prize laureate, the most effective solutions are often community-led. Kennedy, 
brings a deep knowledge and understanding of informal settlements that funders and government cannot. This is true in all communities. Being proximate is essential. Funders can't get close enough to really understand local issues. So we have to build local strength, support local institutions and leaders. Ultimately, this will help facilitate the self-determination that most people seek and our speakers highlighted as core to social progress. And yet, systemic exclusion is pervasive. Edgar Villanueva forces us to examine the origins of inequity, how power is operating, who gets to control and make decisions, how does leadership show up, who is considered an expert. Cheryl Dorsey asks pointedly, are you there for control or transformational change? And are both possible? As the speakers pointed out, good intentions aren't good enough. These are all questions we must be asking ourselves or we risk reinforcing this dynamic. Too often, we presume that local organizations lack capacity and know-how. How can we learn to trust the wisdom and knowledge that actually exists in communities? We've seen so many well-intentioned organizations and donors speaking on behalf of the people whose lives they seek to improve, rather than making space for them to share their own stories and advice. There have not been enough seats at the table for people with lived expertise to contribute in more effective ways. This conversation is an important part of the Hilton Foundation's work to ensure that people with lived expertise are seen, heard first person, and have a meaningful place at the tables where decisions are made. The adage, nothing about me without me, actually and measurably, leads to better outcomes we must hold ourselves accountable to people with lived expertise. Together, the social impact sector can bring more equity to where people with power meet, how people are represented, how funding decisions are made, who is included in important conversations. We can build an inclusion revolution to ensure programs, funding and policy serve people's actual rather than perceived needs. Trust-based philanthropy is critical peers need to influence peers. We don't need to wait for all the answers. As Kennedy said, we just need to get started. Let's not waste this moment. When we set the table for all, we'll realize greater results and a more just world. Well, I want to thank Shaheen Kasim Laka, the Director of Partnerships at the Hilton Foundation for that message. And I'm back again, of course, with my colleague, Amruta Vietnal. Um, Amruta, I just thought we could wrap up our conversation today, which I've learned a lot from, and maybe just ask you, what are some of the key takeaways that, that you got from the discussions today? Right, yeah, I learned a lot too. And I feel like, you know, um, one of the major themes that came up from this conversation was this idea of trust and this idea of working with communities. And that's something that doesn't really get measured. It doesn't really sort of, uh, you know, feature in uh, annual reports, but it's so important as all our panelists have shown us today. And the other point that um, all three of them made was this idea of money and how money equals power and how the distribution of money or the concentration of money uh, really can be an indication of how decolonized uh, the sector is. So maybe that's something that, you know, um, we can keep talking about and we can keep exploring in our reporting going forward as well. Yeah, of course, this is part of the Hilton Humanitarian Prize and, and the content that no normally gets put out in person during that prize ceremony. And when you think about the humanitarian sector, the amount of money that goes to indigenous local organizations doing humanitarian response work is in the single digit percentages. It is really, really small. Um, and this has been a long standing issue. And there's been a lot of uh, community level groups saying we should be receiving a larger portion of the funding. And there's always an argument for why they shouldn't and why the UN system is structured the way it is and the major international NGOs the way they are. And, and yet, at a moment like this, when we're thinking about decolonization, we need to ask ourselves kind of that follow up question of what else can be done? Because if we don't address this, the issue of trust or the issue of money, we'll never get out of the 
the kind of decolonized structures we find ourselves, or the, the colonial structures we find ourselves locked into. Right, absolutely. And, you know, I'm looking forward to how these conversations change over time. And as you know, our network of reporters across the world will continue to track these changes and we'll keep bringing it back to our audience. Yeah, one story this connects a lot to is actually the theme of our next uh, topic in this conversation series with the Hilton Foundation. And that is around the financial technology revolution and what that can mean for innovation in the humanitarian space. So, you know, it's no surprise to people that uh, fintech, as it's known, is exploding around the world with mobile money and the ability to get a digital identification and to, to do all kinds of financial transactions quickly and easily and cheaply in ways we never could have envisioned. That's happening now, and it has implications for the humanitarian sector. Um, obviously, one of those implications relates to this theme around decolonization, because you can now put money in the hands of people who need it directly and give them the opportunity to make decisions for themselves that might have in the past been made kind of at headquarters. So I think it connects really well to this conversation. It's coming up as the next topic in our conversation series. If you want to know about it, uh, follow the Hilton Foundation Twitter account or the DevX Twitter account and stay in the loop um, on these exciting conversations as they continue. Uh, so with that, let me just thank you, Amruta, and thank everyone for, for joining us today. This has been re really a fascinating discussion. Thank you.